When you look at your spreadsheet on your greenhouse operation, and I'm, I'm assuming all of you do that as tax time and everybody's looking at how much money you spent where, we typically see in our energy dollars that most of it goes to heat. A lot of it goes to heat. And if you were to look at your labor cost, you'd see your labor cost and your energy cost are your two primary um, chunks of your budget. So anything we can do to cut our energy cost, our heating cost, we can do, we can actually put more money in our pocket. Look at the natural gas rates um, as they, as from 1975 through uh, the end of the 2000, the first decade in 2000s, um, you can see that the energy market is just spiking and it's driving uh, the, the oil and gas exploration industry to look further, wider, deeper, more difficult, more challenging places to uh, find natural gas. Natural gas is our easiest and cleanest fuel source to use, but one of the things that I'd like to show you are some alternatives. The first one is solar energy. When we talk about solar energy, and people say, I want to build a solar greenhouse, well, the first thing I think of a greenhouse is a solar greenhouse. We're bringing in solar energy all the time. We need to keep that solar energy in our greenhouse when we want it, and we want to keep it out when we don't want it. Solar panels, uh, I've been fiddling with solar panels since the uh, mid-1980s. I've had random levels of success. Um, the challenge is, how do we store that solar energy? Photovoltaics is getting more and more efficient all the time and there may be a day when a photovoltaic system will efficiently be able to use to uh, capture that solar energy. I've actually seen some um, technologies where they're incorporating solar uh, photo photovoltaic technologies into polyethylene film and still able to trans transmit enough light. But getting back to the solar panels that's probably one of the what most people think of. This is a, a water exchange or a liquid exchange where they gly pump glycol in and out of these panels. And underneath these, uh, their beds of lettuce is where their reservoirs sit. Another thing this grower does is they have a, a venting system from the roof and they just pump the hot air out of the roof. And they're able to run this particular greenhouse with no outside fuel. So one of the first things we can do is to get that heat out of the roof. <clears throat> in our homes, we use ceiling fans to push the air down. For those of you who have been in the greenhouse industry long enough, you can remember we used to have ceiling fans that push the air down in our greenhouses. Now we use HAF fans that circulate the, the air. There still is a lot of hot air up in that gable during the heat of the day. And to access that, all you need to do is just put a little duct up there. The challenge is where do we store it? You can pump it down into cinder blocks or gravel or something like that, and you can get some of that energy back. Greenhouse earth solar thermal systems, um, heat pumps, uh, there are a lot of people talking about these. Uh, one of the things that I have seen with the challenge of doing the earth storm, uh, thermal storage is the expense it costs to put the plumbing in the ground. To put that number of wells in the ground, to punch the number of holes in the ground, it gets pretty expensive. So uh, when you start designing systems like this that take that air out, heated air in the daytime and put the in the ground, the technology is there, but whether it's cost effective or whether it's as cheap as natural gas, yet to be seen. I've seen some people that are doing what's called a slinky coil. And basically what it is is just a coiled up tubing. And what's different about the slinky coil system versus the heat source wells where they're pumping, uh, putting a, a hole in the ground 100 feet deep, is you can put this, put this in with a trencher. Most landscape contractors know how to run a trencher. So, and then bury that and you can use that, or they call it a variable scroll system. And you have heat exchanger, that brings it down. Uh, this is some where the, some of the technology is going, 
and they're only going about five feet deep under the greenhouse. This is a system called the Hobbit House. Um, it uh, works reasonably well, and um, John Cruikshank, and I think he passed away a year or so ago, um, developed this system where uh, when the greenhouse is built, puts a network of tubing in the ground with heat exchange. The tubing that they're burying in the ground is this uh, drain pipe, putting a, um, on the right hand slide, we're putting a styrofoam board to insulate somewhat on the inside, and there's a, uh, a, a, t a drum at the top where they're picking up the water, picking up the air out of the greenhouse and circulating it through the ground. This is a, a greenhouse in Scott Scoberbo's backyard. Most of you might, many of you probably know Scott. He's a propagator at Fort Collins Nursery. And uh, I don't know why anybody that propagates plants all day long wants to go home and run a greenhouse, but uh, Scott is a little bit crazy. But those tubings are under this gravel, the tubing that we saw in the previous slide, and we have an intake that uh, pulls the air out of the greenhouse, and these plenums on the uh, end of this greenhouse here, it's, that's where the heat comes back. It, it runs 24-7, and the air is constantly moving between the root, between the greenhouse, into the floor, and out of the floor. Does it keep your greenhouse warm? It does. Is it warm enough to program a tomato crop? No. That's one of the challenges is, you know, if, you, if some of us can deal with a cold frame and we can still get our greenhouse crop on time, but if you're doing a precision crop, if you're growing Easter lilies and you have to hit Easter on the right day, because Easter is one week closer than it can possibly be this year. It's really early. You know, Lent starts middle of May, the middle of February this year. So if you're an Easter lily grower, these kinds of systems where they have temperature fluctuations, they're a challenge to program crops like an Easter lily or a poinsettia or uh, crops that have to have precision in your temperature. Another technology that's growing is called phase change. Phase change technology has come a long way. Uh, phase change technology uh, refers to that energy exchange that we have when you go from one form of matter to another. So a phase change salt or phase change products, how many have made ice cream? When you make ice cream, you're using phase change chemistry to freeze your ice, ice cream. Because when the salt disassociates into the water, it drives the temperature down. We've all mixed up fertilizer and watched the condensation on the side of the bucket. Okay, that's chilling, it's a chilling effect. And that's how we're driving the temperature down. So it, it, we're creating, that, in that case, an endotherm where energy is going in, taking it out of the environment, making it cold. We can use phase change salts to do an exotherm. So for instance, if we have a barrel of water in our greenhouse, a lot of people are using barrels of water to, to absorb that energy during the day. <coughs> that same volume of water here is in these same pipes with phase change salts. So it takes up less, chain, less space. So as the temperature falls with these phase change salts, here's the blue chart is water. And you can see how it gives off heat in a uniform pattern, whereas the phase change salts, they have these little spikes and that's actually energy that you're getting back into the greenhouse. And that's a, the phase change salts or storage materials. Uh, if you look in some of the solar magazines, you can see phase change salts. And there, uh, some companies are starting to market some phase change materials that you can line on your north wall of your greenhouse to, heat, to take, up some of the take up some of that energy during the day and store it. It's much more efficient than putting buckets of water on the wall. Phase change salts. A lot of people, when they think about saving money in the greenhouse, they forget about insulation. <coughs> insulation. We would not not insulate our house. Um, some people have tried these air cap pads. Uh, 
Most people are tempted to sit there and pop them. But if you were to, you can use them for insulation. I don't know how uh, good this is going to work on your greenhouse. <coughs> in, Col <coughs> excuse me. in Colorado and Utah, where we have high light, you can probably get away with it in a propagation house or something like that. But you're going to have a massive reduction in light. And also, with that much of an air gap, you're going to create um, snow loading. One of the things the old glass growers used to do, and uh, those of you who have worked in old Lord and Burnham houses where we have the lap glass, one of the easiest things to do to make those greenhouses a little tighter is to um, put a little bit of transparent caulking in between your panes of glass. The critical thing is that if you have gra glass that's lapped over, the top piece and the bottom piece, make sure that that transparent caulking doesn't have an indentation to catch water. Because if it catches water, it catches dirt. If it catches dirt and water, it's going to grow mold and mildew and algae, and it's going to be worse and give you lots of uh, issues. You can have lower air exchange, and so it's such as that. One of the things that we find that when we get our greenhouses really tight, <coughs> compared to what we used to have when we, we fuel was cheap and we just pumped the heat through our greenhouses, is the humidity is going to be higher. And we have a tendency to need to watch out for foliar diseases in some of these tight houses. Uh, things that you can do, weather stripping. Maintain your glass. Close the gaps under the foundation. Use airlock doors. Most of you go to a restaurant, they have airlock doors. Use those airlock patterns. Make sure that your vent louvers are well lubricated because in this climate, we still use our fans in the middle of the winter. We still use our fans in the middle of winter. So make sure those louvers close well and make sure that they close well and stay closed when the wind blows. Wind never blows in Utah, does it? <coughs> and if you're not using all your fans, put a tarp over them. There are lots of things that we can do to insulate our greenhouses. Most people, though, use polyethylene film. Double poly greenhouses are the most efficient as far as keeping the heat in. Energy savings up to 50%. Of course, you have less light transmission. You have low air exchange. Uh, even if you were to throw a sheet of poly, I can remember back in the, the late 1970s when fuel prices skyrocketed with the oil embargoes and such as that, where growers were just throwing sheets of poly over their roof of their greenhouses and getting away with a lot. So for instance, you could just put poly over your greenhouse. I know a lot of people that will grow build a greenhouse frame, cover it with polyethylene film for three to five years, depreciate the frame, then put the solid roof on. It's a way to fund your operation with a little less money. So some of the patterns you can use. Um, I've also seen people throw sheets of poly over uh, a leaky greenhouse. If you have an old fiberglass greenhouse and the challenge with polyethylene is you need to keep it tight. So if you could put a tube inside to inflate or something like that, these are pictures out of um, uh, an old publication pub put out by the Northeast Regional Ag Agricultural Engineering Group. One of the easiest ways, and the thing that we've been working on at CSU, is uh, nighttime movable insulation, retractable shade. Very few people would not purchase a greenhouse and not install retractable shade if they were building new. But a lot of people say that at to retrofit a greenhouse with retractable shade is just too expensive. I'm going to show you where it's not. So retractable curtains, for those of you that have been in a greenhouse, it's basically a film or a mylar with a luminized netting that can be pulled over in different in sections of your greenhouse to cover your roof or to uncover your roof. The problem is we use the word retractable shade. When you think of retractable shade, you think about keeping your greenhouse cool in the summertime. 
Retractable shade is also very powerful in keeping your greenhouse warm in the wintertime. So here's a greenhouse where you can see the shade curtain starting to be pulled. Here they're wide open. Lots of sunlight, and when the sun is too bright, we'll pull it down. Will you still use it with the double poly? Absolutely. We're going to put this inside the greenhouse. Now, I have seen people put uh, shade over the double poly on the outside in the summertime just to keep the heat out, and that does work. But when you put shade cloth on the outside, uh, you do stop the sun from coming in at all, which is going to help you keep the greenhouse a little <coughs> cooler but it also collects a dot of dirt and debris and stuff is like that. And it takes extra label to put it on. These kinds of curtains, we're going to put on the greenhouse when we build it. And I, I would recommend you put it on a double poly house, a polycarbonate house, a glass house, doesn't matter. So these retractable curtains, open and close. You can work them on a timer. You can work them on an environmental control system. Uh, I've even seen people that refuse to spend the money with Cravo or Wadsworth or Nexus and try to build these out of garage door openers. It works. Most greenhouse managers are pretty good engineers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, such as that. So this is what we're losing. With no curtain, we're losing almost one full BTU per hour per square foot. If we just put a porous cloth, just shade cloth, over that, we're automatically dropping it down to less than 0.6 BTUs per square foot. This is energy savings. Even if you were just to go in the wintertime and hang up cloth. However, the wintertime is when we have the lowest level of light. So if you're going to put up a curtain that you're going to be fixed in place, you can't open it up to let the light in. Non-porous material, like I've seen growers just hang sheets of poly. But the aluminized material, it's at 0.3 BTUs per hour per square foot. That's how much it's going to save you. So we've been doing some studies where we've been tracking the energy input into a greenhouse where we have retractable shade. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit about how this graph is set up uh, before we get started in the data so you can understand what direction I'm going. What we did is we set up two houses at CSU. We have two research houses that are brand new, side by side, where one, and they all have retractable shade and they all have the same heating systems. So one night, series of nights, when it was like five degrees below zero. We left one roof open, the retractable curtains open, and one closed, and we monitored, monitored how much the heaters ran. And from that, we could calculate the, what we call the heating degree hours. So this, on the uh, y-axis, we have the cumulative heating run time, how much the unit ran, how many hours it ran each night, and <coughs> the heating degree hours based upon the temperature outside, the temperature inside, that we had to calculate on what we needed to keep the greenhouse at. So that's the run time. And this is the heating degree hours. And you calculate the heating degree hours. Uh, the the uh, housing engineers use a base value of 65 degrees for every 24 hours as your base temperature and what it keeps to keep that building warm. So in an uncovered greenhouse, as the heating degree hours rose for that structure throughout the night, as the heating degree demand on that heating system, our heater units over that night period ran almost three solid hours. Now you know they cycle on and off, on and off. They ran almost three hours, so it ran from one point to another. So a total consumption of fuel for three solid hours of burn. By keeping that shade system closed, so we started our heating at 25 heating degree hours. By keeping the system closed, 
We didn't turn on the system until 285 hours and almost half an hour runtime. Now this is a greenhouse, that's the university greenhouse, it's got concrete floors, double poly, triple polycarbonate sidewalls, single carbonate roof. It was 15 degrees outside that night. So we have a lot of heat mass that's already holding that heat in, that we've already paid for, or we didn't pay for, but the sun gave it to us. So that's a pretty massive difference. Can you afford to put <coughs> retractable curtains in an old greenhouse? Absolutely. The manufacturers say, they'll tell you there's a three year payback. If we have winters like we've been having lately, last winter was pretty mild, probably a three year payback. If this winter continues the way it's continuing, it's not three years, it's 18 months. So, 438, 436 heating degree hours, open, 2.69 hours of heater time, 436 heating degree hours, 0 0.295 hours of heating time. Let me put that into terms of fuel. 2.69 hours of heater time, savings of 2.39 hours. These are 250,000 BTU per hour unit heaters. Open currents, open required 672,000 BTUs of fuel versus 73,000 BTUs of fuel. That's money in your pocket. Okay? Plain and simple. You look at how much, you know, you get a thousand BTUs per cubic foot of gas or a therm of gas. The Gulf Coast, and you talk about people at sea level, they don't understand the difference between a cubic foot and a therm because we have elevation to deal with. So there's a way to save fuel. Insulate, insulate, insulate. Retractable curtains. And no, George Dean at Wadsworth Company did not pay me to say that. <coughs> so another way we can save energy is to look at our electricity. It's not a big, com big a component as our natural gas, but still, it is a big component of what runs our greenhouse because we use fans. So active cooling uses a wet pad system and we pull the air across the greenhouse and run our fans. Why do we need to cool our greenhouses? Well, 277 BTUs per square foot per hour on the face of the earth on a summer day. Most of you in Utah know that it gets pretty warm those coastal areas not quite so bad, but 85% of that energy coming into the greenhouse, it's reabsorbed into the system and absorbed by our structure, converted to infrared energy, comes back off as heat, it's captured in our greenhouse, and we've got this massive capture of heat during the summer months. It'd be nice if we could store that summer heat for the winter, wouldn't it? That's where the photovoltaics, hopefully eventually, will come into point. So greenhouse cooling in our climate is based upon um, adiabatic cooling, evaporative cooling. And a couple things you need to understand, a little bit about what I'm going to talk about here, is the difference between dry bulb temperature and wet bulb temperature. Dry bulb temperature is that actual temperature of the day, actual temperature of the air, with a thermometer. The wet bulb temperature, or some people call it the wet sock temperature, that's the temperature that the w if water was evaporated off of that thermometer, what it would be. For instance, I'm assuming most of you took a shower today. When you turned the shower off, you got chilled. You got chilled because the water was evaporating off of your skin, and that was taking that energy out of your body. So you are basically a wet bulb thermometer. So the difference between a wet bulb thermometer and the dry bulb thermometer is how we calculate our, our um, relative humidity, and it also relates to our fan and pad systems. So an evaporative cooling system takes about 
1,060 BTUs of heat out of the air for every pound of water that we evaporate. And that's why swamp coolers in Utah and Arizona and New Mexico and Colorado work and don't work in Florida because they have more water in the air and there's not enough difference to take the energy out. This is a psychrometric chart. Uh, the dry bulb temperature is on the bottom and we have the wet bulb temperature on the top. We calculate this with a psychrometer um, where they come together. So for instance here we have, and you cannot read these numbers, it's 90 degrees um, 90 degree dry bulb temperature, 75 degree wet bulb temperature, that's 50% relative humidity. The wet bulb temperature doesn't change much because it's based upon the volume of moisture in the air. Okay? As the dry bulb temperature moves to the left and gets colder, this moves this way till it hits 100%. When the dry bulb temperature and the wet bulb temperature are the same, what do we get? Dew. You get dew. Or if it's below freezing, you get frosted windshield. So that's what we see. So we take advantage of that system. So in a greenhouse, we need an active air exchange. Most greenhouses are designed to have an active air exchange of one per minute. In other words, we're going to take the volume out of that greenhouse and we're going to suck it out of the greenhouse one volume every minute to make the active cooling pad system work effectively. We need to design our fans and our pad surface areas so that we can pull one air exchange per minute. Now that seems like a lot. It won't even mess your hair. Certainly won't mess mine. I don't have much. But it doesn't, it, it's not a, a mass thing, but we need that one air exchange per minute. And that's what we design under the maximum operating conditions. Remember, we design greenhouses for maximums and minimums, not the average. Because if you, have, if you design your greenhouse the average temperature of Salt Lake City, it would not be very nice today. We also have to take into account the elevation, how much light, your temperature rise, we're not going to go into the math calculations today. So you have to design it based upon your, your cooling requirement. You make sure that you put the fans that will draw that much energy, draw that much air. And we typically put the pads on one side and the fans on the other. Pretty much a no-brainer. We need to calculate the temperature rise from one end to the other. The standard is 7 degrees. In other words, it comes into the cooling pad at 75. By the time it gets across your whole greenhouse, we only want it to rise 82 degree, 7 degrees or 82, up to 82 degrees, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. What that does is it's about the best way we can keep a uniform cooling across that greenhouse. If you don't want that 7 degree rise, you have to speed your fan up. Or if you can deal with a, lo a lower, a greater rise, you slow it down. <coughs> so, showed you this before. Most of our energy expense is heat. But ventilation is still 10%. And electricity is getting more and more expensive. At what time of day do you need to run your fans the most? Middle of the day. Power company starting to do what they call rolling brownouts. Anybody have a brownout sensor on their air conditioner at home? I have that. The city gave me a rebate of five dollars a month to put it on. What it does is it turns my air compressor, the refrigeration compressor, off when they want to cut back on energy consumption in the grid. The time of day they cut that off, I'm not home. I have never been able to determine if the thing is ever operated. And they tell me they do it every summer, every week. And I've never been able to tell. That so if we can find ways to cut our energy consu consumption during the highest demand times of day, 
And as the net metering laws get less and less regulated, we'll be able to cut deals with the power companies to choose how much power we would buy at different times of the day. Now, AC electricity, and um, my graduate student put some of these graphics together. I'm not this good. And I'm a plant physiologist, so I'm going to give you the plant physiologist interpretation of an alternating current. In the United States, alternating current is 60 cycles per second. Okay? 60 cycles per second. Now, we use alternating current in the United, to deliver power because DC current, direct current, is inefficient to transfer over long distances. So that electron has got to go from here to here for it to work. With alternating current, the electron has to go from here to here, bang, transfers that energy to the next one, bang, and it goes back and forth like a Newton's cradle. Okay? That's the plant physiologist interpretation of electricity. Okay? Now, how many ever remember having a railroad train? Electric railroad train. You had that little thermos rheostat, run it up and down, stuff like that. That's DC current. We can change the current to change the speed. AC current, it's based upon the frequency. Exhaust motors use AC current. And I got my graphics mixed up. The way an electric motor operates, an induction motor operates, is that it takes the alternating current and it fires a magnet. <coughs> that magnet pulls another magnet towards it. The next one fires, pulls the magnet towards it. The next one fires, pulls the magnet towards it, and creates the spinning motion. Okay, that's called an induction motor. And the faster they run, the more power they pull. So the higher the frequency, so AC induction motors, the speed is based upon, the shaft of the space is based upon the frequency. And there's a technology called variable frequency drive. Now, as that motor spins with that rotor in, this, in the stator, as it spins, magnetic field changes with the alternating current, and that's what drives the motor. And it's all based upon 60 cycles per second. What a variable frequency drive system does is it takes that AC power, converts it to DC power, then remodulates it into pulses that you can control the cycles per second. So the motor um, revolutions can be changed according to the demand that's needed. Now, this is a, you can buy these variable frequency drive devices. There's common now, uh, you can go to Granger and buy one. I mean, that's, you can get one that'll run three motors for about 200 bucks. And my graduate student installed it. Realistically, an, an electrician probably should have done it, but his dad's an electrician, he's done them all his life, so. What it does is it speeds up and slows up, speeds up and slows down the fans based upon the demand. Remember, our cooling systems are designed for the maximum. They're designed for the maximum and the minimum. They're either on or off. But if you could turn the motor on slowly, you might be able to modulate your temperature better and spend less money. So some of the things that are hard on a fan motor, um, when we're turning those fans on and off, on and off, on and off, cycling all day long, we have what's called short cycling. We don't quite need a full run of our fans, so it's going to turn on for a while, turn off for a while. And I'm sure we've all heard those slamming of the motors and the squeaking of the belts, of that sucker turning on. That's called inrush current, because we're pushing all that voltage into that greenhouse, all that voltage into that fan motor at once, 
and it takes a lot of energy to get it started. It takes less energy to run it after it's started. And that's called inrush current. And those hard starts will be the hardest thing on the life of a motor. And there's another thing that we can take advantage of. It's called the affinity law. The affinity law is where we save our money. So inrush current, and this is the start of a fan. When the fan motor turns on, it consumes up to 10 times its normal full amp load. So if it's a 20 amp fan, it's going to pull 20 amps when it turns on. Now it's going to drop down to three or four amps as it's running once it starts. But that full amp burst is what costs us our money. And it's hard to see with, a, with an amp meter unless you monitor it. This is also what damages our equipment. Lots of hard starts is going to shorten the life of your motor. So if you can create a soft start using a variable frequency drive, you can start in some of that. Are you saying, are you saying then you can install that, the, the BFD uh, already on the system as it stands now? You can install the VFD system in line between your um, power supply and the fan motor itself. And it'll, it will control it. And you can con then control how fast the fan's going to turn on at different temperatures. The easiest way to do this is to control it with a ramp controller, like if you have a Wadsworth or a Priva greenhouse climate control system, and you control it like a steam valve. And you ramp, as your delta T gets bigger, you run faster RPMs. They do have thermostats that you can buy for these that will control it more simply. Uh, I've talked to people that have used these in potato barns for storing potatoes, and they've cut their fan costs by 60%. But you can take the existing motor that you have today, buy one of these and put it in between your panel and, and the motor. The challenge is where do you control it? We're controlling ours like you would control a steam valve using a um, current as the temperature increases and such as that. But it reduces that, that short cycle, so the fan might just turn on really slow. And that's, uh, that's all purchased with uh, Granger? You can purchase these at Granger. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that the, you have one that is a thermostat that does the same thing with the FB? Yes. OK, and that's also Granger? Yes. If you replace the regular thermostat with this, um, I'd have to look at how, you, how your system is wired. OK. So the, what this does is it eliminates that cold air rush when the fan turns on. Eliminates that shock, because we're just pulling the air in slowly and ramping it up. And that also cuts our cost. So. What it is, the affinity law, is a change in power is proportional to the cube of the change in speed. And what that means, if we're running a fan at 50% RPM, it requires 12.5% of the same power. So we're dropping our fan speed by half, and we're cutting our cost 85% because the closer you get to that maximum speed, the closer it is to the full number of kilowatts. And we've uh, installed these little meters on our system to determine this. Um, research, there's only a couple of research articles that they've looked at this. Uh, by using variable frequency drives in greenhouses, it cuts our power bill by 36%. 36%. Again, these are not expensive devices to install. Um, what we're looking at is installing it on half of the fans in your greenhouse. So you have one that ramps up, and when it hits full speed, then the other fan turns on. 
So there are different things that you can do, different technologies you can look at for controlling that. One of the things that we found is that the humidity and temperature levels in the greenhouse were more uniform. Uniform, more uniform across the greenhouse. So if you've ever grown a crop where, especially Easter lilies, where uh, some of the old growers say you used to grow Easter lilies in a wheelbarrow because you'd be moving them all over the house to keep them crop uniform. From the cold side to the warm side, the warm side to the cold side, back and forth, back and forth. We've probably all done that with something. These systems also have a more uniform uh, temperature. So one of the things that we looked at is comparing plant growth and looking at the, how the system works. And we found that it uses, actually it uses a little more water across the greenhouse. But that's because it's more uniform across the greenhouse. Um, to make it work, uh, we use modulated voltage output, which takes a DC signal to the VFD sensor. So uh, measuring, correlating the difference in the delta T in the, in the computer control system to the um, uh, linear. And it was able, we were able to ramp it at 5, 10, 15, 20. We did it 5, 10, 20, 40, 60, so forth. So you can ramp it and get lots of different settings to run your fans. More uniform environment, uniform airflow, um, such as that. Now, so these two uh, graphs is what I really wanted to show you. The top level graph is um, the traditional fan. The bottom is the VFD fans. And what you can see, these spikes just happen to catch inrush current. We take a little amp clamp, a little amp meter, and clamp it onto the, to the wire, and it hooks up to, that, to the sensor where we can see when a unit turns on or off. So we just happen to catch data. So these are, this is inrush current. This is what's costing money. This is what's uh, damaging your fans and such as this. With the VFDs, you can see everything is more uniform, runs more smoothly, and we don't have the inrush spikes. These inrush spikes will cost you your money. Um, this is a little device uh, called um, that you can purchase on the internet. Uh, measure, it's designed for people to put in their homes, but it worked really well for us monitoring our energy costs in the greenhouse. So. Anyway, that's uh, two ideas for gathering, uh, saving money in a greenhouse. Shade curtains, variable frequency drives. These are technologies that exist today. These are technologies that you can find, the, the VFD technology you can find in the Metro St. Uh, Paul, uh, St. Paul, Metro Salt Lake City area today. Um, the retractable shade curtain systems. Um, there are several companies that sell them and manufacture them. You can have them installed uh, very easily. You can do them yourself. Um, I would hire somebody to do it because running those cables is pretty tricky, um, but uh, this is stuff that you can do. Um, my website on SlideShare, where the recordings will be, is slideshare.net, snewman7118. My website is greenhouse.colostate.edu. And this is my email. This is one of the grad students who did some of the work. <laughs>